all uh, to the fifth day of our International Lecture Series on Language and Literature 2020. We take great pleasure to have with us now Dr. Binu James Matthew in our last session who would like who would enlighten us with uh, new insights. So let me now introduce Dr. Binu James Matthew. Dr. Binu James Matthew is an assistant professor and former deputy head academic quality assurance unit at College of Banking and Financial Studies, Oman. Dr. Matthew has had 25 years of teaching, training, and research experience in English language and general management subjects. Previously, he worked with the University of Mumbai and Institute of Management Studies, Mumbai. He also served as a sub-Lieutenant Naval NCC in Mumbai during his tenure with University of Mumbai. Dr. Mathieu holds a PhD from IIT Bombay, MA and MPhil Research in English, MBA in Customer Relationship Management, and is certified as a Cambridge University CELTA qualified teacher. He is also a certified trainer conducting training courses in the areas that include business communication, customer service, emotional intelligence, and leadership and teamwork. He has widely presented papers at several international conferences and published his research papers in national and international journals. He is passionate about music and has a YouTube channel as a hobby. So now I would like to request Dr. Binu James Mathieu to kindly start his session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I have to proceed by saying that employable skills is basically the much sought after skill set that is demanded by the employers. So I've collected some of those key skills which are useful, especially for the students to develop over a period of time, especially they are uh, in their universities and their colleges, so that once they hit the job market, they know the value of this because your employers are looking forward to having these skill sets. Right, um, I, let me see whether I can share this more. There's nothing much to hear. short clip may be exaggerated, but it speaks about the lack of communication between the employer and even the customers. They were, you can say that, you know, both of them are at fault. One is not able to speak the language. The other one is not able to understand the gestures where she asks for a spoon and not to stir with his own hand. So this is what, uh, you know, happens when there is lack of understanding, lack of skill set within an organization within the workplace. All right, you might have guessed this person whom I'm displaying at the moment. Yeah, it's none other than Charles Darwin, who said the, it's a, not the strongest of the species that survive, not the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. When Professor Leon McGinson, when he summarized Charles Darwin's origin of species, he said one of the core important messages that Charles Darwin is trying to convey is that change or you will die, very strong message. And we have been uh, listening to this, we have been seeing it live in our own phase of, um, you know, in this corona phase that we have been through. If you're not able to adapt yourself and the sudden changes that happens around the world, it's, not, it's, it's very difficult for us to survive or sustain in the career world. We can talk about species also, dinosaurs who walked on this earth, uh, magnanimous animals, but they all perished because of one event or the other. They couldn't adapt to change. Whereas change adaptability, you can see, is much more robust in the creatures like you know, crocodiles or cockroaches or even the mice that we see around. So it is not the size of the person. Uh, it's, it's not that you know, how strongest you are but how adaptable you are in adjusting the situation, it's called adaptability, 
that is what is the need of the time. All right. Um, in this session, I'll be speaking about seven uh, areas, starting with the introduction on the employability skills. Then I'll speak about the communication skills, emotional intelligence, which was touched upon by the previous speaker. I was so enlightened to hear that um, time management, stress, right attitude, and brand you. So I hope this within this uh, one hour, we'll be able to finish it adequately uh, with all these discussions. Now, what is employability? What are employability skills? What is the term employability skills? What does it mean by that? The term means that you know it's a set of skills, understandings, and personal attributes that make graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful in their chosen occupations, which benefits themselves, the workforce, and the community and the economy. So it serves not only the individual, but the society at large, the community that we serve, that's also important. All right, so just moving on to the next one. Now, the term employability skills is very common, very popular around the world but they're known by different names referring to the same thing, same aspect. In UK, they're said to be the core skills or key skills or common skills. In Australia, it's said to be generic skills or also employability skills. These are other terms mentioned on this. In Canada, again, employability skills. In France, they're said, said to be transferable skills. They are the skills which can be transferred from one designation, one post to the other without any change. In fact, the higher you go in the management ladder, in your corporate ladder, you will require the skill sets much more than the middle level employees, the middle uh, level or, or the middle stage of the employment uh, situation. In Germany, they are called the key, trans, uh, key qualifications and in Denmark, the process independent qualifications. So what do we call it? The most common word what we see here in employable skills is very soft skills. I think you have heard very common. The word soft skills. Even those of you who have not heard employability skills must have heard about the word soft skills. So what is it, hard skills and the soft skills? Now, hard skills is the ability coming from one's knowledge, practice, aptitude to do something well, especially the subject specializations that you take is a hard skill. Whether you're taking language or history or geography or engineering or medicine, the main skill set, the skill set that you have been taught at the university is called the hard skills. Though that needs a lot of training, understanding, reading, experimentation in some cases. Whereas soft skills, it's not very tangible. They are also uh, an important element in the emotional quotient, the EQ or the emotional quotient of the person. They're desirable qualities. They do not depend on an acquired knowledge. They include common sense. Now, we always say common sense is not very common. Or the ability to deal with people and positive and flexible attitude. So you can see that the employability skills, if you look at it, you know, in this table, you can see in the left and the right, one of the tables is the hard skill. The other one is the soft skills or the employability skills. I think you can, if you look through that, you will be able to understand that there is a, 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 huge, a huge set, a huge number of soft skills which are there. Hard skills are the specialisms that you study at the university. The specializations that you chose in the university, operating special, specific tools, analyzing the data, your research skills, giving instructions, these are hard skills. Employability skills, on the other hand, is uh, something which is not tangible something which is not palpable. At the same time, everybody can feel about your employability skills. It's the body language, it's the presentation skills, the decision-making skills, it could be the stress management, how you contain the stress, or it's your time management and organizational skills. So you can see a plethora of uh, skill sets are required in the employability skills, as the employability skills. However, university doesn't teach them as an explicit subject. Now, when you say university doesn't teach them, you know, if you look at character traits and interpersonal traits, that's all combining towards the employability skills. Now, there are lots of character traits uh, which are very individual to a person, which is not, um, you know, which is not similar to the other person. 
employability skills can be sometimes very unique for yourself. It could be something which makes you stand out in the crowd. There are several studies so far spoke about employability skills and that it is found said that 75% of your long-term job success depends on people skills. And only 25% is the technical knowledge, the subject, the books that you read that will give you. Another research says that employers are progressively looking for employees who, can, who are mature and socially well-adjusted. Now, when you talk about socially well-adjusted, social intelligence is to understand the people around us, how to behave in a, among a group of people, how to treat others among the public. They are the rated as the highly demanding soft skills, the number one important soft skills, especially at the entry level success in the job. It is also said that Watson Watts research speaks about hard skills contribute only 15 percentage to one success. 85 percentage success is due to soft skills. And you want to, to be more specific, soft skills are not just giving success at your work, but even to the satisfaction of your life, soft skills are essential, especially the emotional skills that you have. Now, having said these, okay, all the definitions there, are the educational institutions responsible for employability skill development? Of course, yes. Universities have a major role. In fact, many of those soft skills, although not it is explicitly visible to students, it is actually within the graduate attributes within the extra and the co-curricular activities. The university's modules that you have are there, if it is a group project, you are just not doing as a, you're not just working together, you're learning team working skills, you're learning organizational skills, you're learning how to delegate responsibilities of a project, you're learning how to beat the time, you're learning how to organize things. Personal management skills are also learned through this. So they are embedded within the modules of the university courses, although it's not visible to everybody. The classroom is an ideal ground, Lydia Breckman says, uh, where one can practice alternate ways of dealing with people and facilitating learning and transferring knowledge in an interactive rather than prescriptive form. So universities have a major role to play. And if a student is keen to understand, they can, they can enrich their own employability skills while you're studying at the university for four years or six years. Students should look for the opportunities that can enrich their work experience. Now, I'm sure you know that the employment market is not very, uh, um, you know, not very promising as you can see now, but still people get job. Okay, last week my cousin got a job and I was very surprised at this downturn of economy. He got a job, but he could definitely be, you know, employable because he has improved his employability skill sets. Now, how can he improve? Now, as students, it's a very common thing to ask. I'm a student, I'm a full-time student, unlike in the Western countries where you work part-time, how can you improve, how can I improve my employability skills? Where do I get the work experience? Well, there are, there are responses to this. Where are, there are ways and channels in which you can Im improve your employability skills. If you are having clubs in the university, if you're having some events in the university, if you can manage those events, if you can have associations within the university, that's a way to improve your employability skills. The only thing is at the end of the tenure, you should have a piece of paper, the certificate, which states that you have been involved in this activity. Having said about the college uh, you know, institutional responsibility, it's also the responsibility mainly on the student to develop their employability skills. I can see during the weekends, some of my students in Muscat um, standing in the supermarkets, serving samples of you know, some sachets or anything to the customers. So it is in the weekends. Now, it is not that you need to work in a blue chip company to have your employability skills. It can be a charity work. It can be as common as any other simple work that you're involved in. I've seen some of my students, there during the break, the summer break of two months, they went to Egypt and you know, had taught in a school for six weeks as a summer school, and they came back. Now, tomorrow, your employer is going to look at your CV. Look at, there are 4,000 CVs applying for a few positions. What makes you stand different? You know, everybody is doing a project. Everybody is doing the same modules at the university. So some people are doing something extra, and they stand out. 
you are really being looked at by the employers that, yeah, somebody has tested this person. So employees just want to know, how was this product? Okay, how was this candidate? So has somebody tested on this candidate? How was the can at candidate's aptitude and the attitude in the workplace? Every individual is a marvel of the unknown and unrealized possibility, Kete says. Now, perhaps because of the importance of soft skills, and I'm certain that you might have heard about psychometric tests in by some of the organizations, especially the multinational companies. I hope you have heard about it. It has become a part of many of the multinational companies that they have to. They are trying to measure the suitability for a role of the candidate, not just by the marks and the grade and the percentage. Percentage shows the IQ, but the EQ, the emotional quotient, is only revealed when a person is put together in a, among a group of people. Psychometric tests are a battery of questions, computer-generated questions, prepared by psychologists, which is hard to uh, lie because the same situation is given through different questions and it's impossible to crack it. The advantage of psychometric test is it eliminates the personal bias the, the, in, the, the interview board might perhaps have. We all have unconscious bias looking at people, oh, she's from there, she's from this nationality, the caste, the color, the creed, and the sex. We might have this kind of unconscious, even if we deny certain things. It is to eliminate these things. Many of the companies are resorting to psychometric tests because computers can analyze human beings' aptitude and their attitude based on the battery of questions. And it's with, with the digital algorithm, it's taken back to see whether this person is suitable. For example, a person from the HR, the human resources department, she has to be a, a, a people-oriented person. He has to deal with, talk to people. He cannot be a shy introvert. So this is extremely important to see whether you fit in to that particular position. Okay, further going down to the next one. Now, these are some of the sets that we have, some of the tables that we have that speaks about soft skills which are high in demand. You can see on the left side, some of these attributes, communication, integrity, interpersonal skills, professionalism, responsibility, teamwork. These are some of the things which are uh, work ethics also. These are some of the things which are extremely important for the, uh, for the, uh, for the 21st century. Now, while looking at, I have also seen that there was a survey conducted by University of Bradford and they have given it as employers have identified a set of nine generic capabilities they're looking for. Some of the things uh, may be soft skills, but some of the things could be hard skills also. But you can see that communication skills and presentation of oneself is also there. Innovation and enterprise is also there. Problem solving skills, teamwork. Okay, all these, some of the things, commercial awareness is important there. Some of the skills they're looking for. Now, as we're speaking in the COVID world or the post-COVID world, I've also, I was looking for some collections of the post-COVID employability skills or soft skills. Now look at some of these predictions by conducted by Polyglot Group, which found that adaptability, now change can happen incredibly fast as we realized in 2020. All those people who have been working with organizations were suddenly asked to go home and every teamwork, every activity, came to a complete standstill. So change is, is immediate and change is permanent. So this is some of the skills and agility, how to adaptable to change is an extremely important soft skills in the post-COVID world. Second one is emotional intelligence. We're gonna talk about this. The third one is growth mindset, thriving on the challenges and see the failure as opportunities for growth, uh, curiosity, open to learning. In fact, you know, until you die, you know, there are chances for you to learn new things, new skills, and new abilities, and I strongly believe in it. Creativity and innovation, you know, there are a lot of diversification strategies. If you're able to shift the original products and the services, because today's competition, if you look at any, any particular business world, it is not just about the product. Look at the supermarkets, look at the banks, um, look at the, you know, all the shops that we see around they thrive on the differentiation of how they can improve the service because the products are almost the same. Look at the hypermarkets and the supermarkets. Everywhere, every product is same. So what difference does it make? It's a human beings. It's a somebody, the salesperson that you talk to, that you make a difference over there. 
that's very important. Now, communication skills, as we said earlier, look at this. In a study conducted in USA, out of 3,000 people, 45 people said that their number one fear was speaking to an audience. Only 30 percentage feared death, for example. So you can see that a person who lies in the death, the casket is luckier than somebody who speaks to a group of people. So public speaking is said to be the number one fear. Later on, the second one comes here as death and the spiders. The darks and heights. So you can see that it's it's a, what are the greatest fears in people? It's a uh, public speaking. Three out of every four individuals suffer from speech anxiety. That is the seventy five percentage. Now, what is the term for fear of public speaking? What is the specific term for it? Do you have any idea about the word, the formal word for fear fear of public speaking? The term glossophobia, sir. Of course. Thank you for that. Who is this? Can you na name, please. <laughs> May, uh, sir, this is Obishikta. Uh, actually, we teach this in our classrooms as well. Wonderful. Okay. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. Glossophobia. And the word has, I mean, it is from the two words. Glossa means in tongue. Like in Latin, phobia is a fear. So fear of speaking in front of people. So mastering oral and written communication increases your chances in the professional world. Managers, employers are looking forward to somebody who can speak well. Somebody who can express their ideas, especially in today's world, mostly in email communication. How who is who who is effective in those? That's what they are looking forward. Now, in a verbal and non-verbal communication, if you look at the face-to-face -face communication, you can see um, anyone can answer. How much is the non-verbal aspect of communication? I'm sure some of you can. Uh, how much is the non-verbal? The if you take away percentage, what is the percentage of non-verbal communication? when compared to words in a face-to-face -face, uh, situation. All right, so, um, okay, let's let's look at that. Look at the attributes. It's only 7% that the words actually carry the meaning, especially in the face-to-face -face situation. We don't just look at the people and, okay, just listen to what the words they said, but we observe people carefully. We observe the cues, the body language, the non-verbal signs and the gestures. Those are very important. So if you ask somebody in the morning, you met somebody in the office and say, so how are you? He says, I'm fine. Now, what do you understand? Is the person fine? Certainly not. Here the words, I am fine is grammatically, literally, linguistically means the person is fine. But it's not the words. The words have no meanings over there. When somebody you see standing and speaking, or even you, if you see the person start speaking, you observe the person sitting at the stage. You make a you make a judgment on the person. You make a judgment on the person's body language, gestures, the costumes that they wear, the grooming of the hair, you know, the trimming of the mustache. So you make a lot of non-verbal um, judgments, passing on this judgment before you actually hear, hear this person speak. And that's very important. So it is very surprising. Ninety-three percent of the face-to-face -face communication is conveyed by means other than words. Now we are in the in, a, in an online situation, so I would also bring the element of uh, uh, the telephonic communication. How much is the telephonic communication percentage? Eighteen percentage only is the content of the language, the, uh, the language and the content. Eighty-two percentage is the tone, the voice, the volume, and how they said. The same thing you speak to somebody and say, uh, "How are you?" And this person, "I'm fine." So you can you can make out from the tone, the tonality, the voice, and the volume. The person is not really feeling well. Okay, so that's what is it. So body language. When we speak in a in a face-to-face -face communication situation, we speak in two languages: the verbal language and the body language. The body language speaks louder than the words. So it's not what that what you say that counts. It's actually what you don't say that counts. People make judgments about you. People make, people look at you how and what you are by seeing you, not by just hearing your words. So let's learn how to make a great impression, great first impression. Be on time, be yourself, be at ease. Present yourself appropriately. A word about individuality, the winning smile, that's what another thing is. Be open and confident. Small talk goes a long way. Be positive. The positive attitude is one of those highly uh, important employability skills, being positive and being optimistic. So make sure you, you hang out with your friends who are positive. 
we look at the future with, you know, seeing that there's, there's some hope in the future, hope despite the hopelessness. So be courteous and attentive, that's very important. So these are very important uh, aspect of creating great first impressions. Now let's talk about social media. We when they speak about communication, we can't put social media away. I'm sure students these days are involved in several of those social media. Even the, you know, some of our students have changed from Facebook. Some of our children have seen changed from Facebook because they know that the parents are also there. So they have gone to some you know something which the parents don't use. You know, maybe a few parents use Instagram, maybe or sometimes uh, uh, Telegrams. So they use something else which which are not used by them now. The point here we speak about social media is do not forget as a student you can use social media that's your choice but don't forget to connect yourself in linkedin i think you have heard about it several of the employers first look at your profile and your updates on the linkedin create a, it's like just like a uh, facebook social media the only thing is here you post your professional achievements make sure every few months you upload something new about you. You attended a program, you attended a seminar online, just post the certificate over there and connect yourself with your professors, your employers. Now, it's very important to keep the networking um, in your, in your, during your college days also. Um, I don't know how many of you have, uh, have been acquainted with the students of other specializations, other departments, teachers of other departments or with the administration. If you can now, Tomorrow, when you go out, sometimes you never know what kind of connections will bring you a job. Keep yourself abreast of the changes. Keep the networking extremely strong. It's, it's mostly if you look around, people with good people skills are much in demand these days. And you know what I'm talking about. So keep yourself posted in the LinkedIn and be very careful what you post in the social media. Okay, we have seen this kind of the three monkeys, the famous monkeys, right? So we all know about this um, very popular, okay, um, hear no evil, speak yes. no evil, and see no evil. But in the today's world, there is also a fourth monkey, and the fourth monkey is also an extremely important one. Post no evil. See that your digital footprints can be traced by anyone in the future. It's not, it's, it's not um, I mean, it, it is difficult to erase everything. So what you post... Uh, on a social media, maybe in with, uh, hanging out with the friends, it shouldn't be a detrimental um, as impact on your future career. When somebody looks at it in some place, or they feel, feel that, oh, look at this person, how can it behave like that? So be very careful. It's a fast and quick medium, social media. However, be careful what you post in and around it. Okay, so let's proceed with number third one, that is the emotional intelligence. Um, Emotional intelligence, as it was earlier mentioned by the previous speaker, I was happy to see that it's the ability to monitor one's own feelings and emotions and then use that information to guide one's own thinking and actions. And it also goes to the extent of uh, to say that emotional intelligence is much more than IQ for life satisfaction, not just success at work. In order for you to be success, uh, satisfied in your life, Emotional intelligence is extremely important. As in the case of soft skills, as we mentioned earlier, emotional skills or emotional quotient is not very much visible. You see only the tip of the iceberg. The research, however, shows that a successful person, 80% uh, of the, you know, the success is attributed to the emotional quotient, and only 20% is for the actual intelligence quotient. So I'm not uh, denying the fact that no, your intelligence is important or your marks are important, your score and the ranking is important. They are important. However, make sure that you're emotionally stable in order to, uh, to become satisfied in life. Now, again, the four components of emotional intelligence are self-awareness and the self-management. When you know that, you know, what are your, uh, how you feel, what are you feeling? Why are you feeling moody? Okay, and then how to manage your moods, then you're aware of how to treat others with empathy. Empathy is one of the important skills to be acceptable by the society. Empathy is one step ahead of sympathy. Sympathy is you feel sad for the man or poor man. That's a sadness. Empathy is you can feel the feelings. You can 
feel that you can sense the pulses of a person who is going through suffering, suffering or misery. It is further down to relationship management. People with good relationship management, especially they can um, they can talk in a group. They can have good. Uh, they can well. They are they're very 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 much. They can gel very well with the friends. They are said to be highly good with the emotional intelligence. That's the fourth realm of emotional intelligence. In fact, emotional intelligence or EI circles around self-awareness, self-motivation, self-regulation, and controlling yourself, social skills, and empathy skills. Uh, that's what it is. And it is said that four out of 10 people at work are not able to work cooperatively with their fellow employees. Now, collaboration, cooperating with employees is an extremely important skill. And that's perhaps the reason you can see that teamwork, group projects are a part of many of those modules these days because they want you to work as a team, not as an individual. You may be very high with your IQ, but if you're not emotionally strong, it can break you. It can uh, clip your wings altogether. So understand that your emotions will lead to thoughts and definitely that will lead to behavior and behavior will impact your performance and the outcomes at work. Emotions are, in, are contagious, just like I said before. Make sure that the people that you are surrounded by are people with positive attitudes. Make sure, pick and choose the people and try to avoid people with negative, pessimistic approach to, to life because they will pull you down. They will take you away from your, your, your dreams, your aspirations altogether. When we mention this, okay, when we mention employability skills, as we mentioned earlier, time management is an important aspect of it organizing and managing yourself, otherwise time management, the fourth point out of seventh one. Now, when you talk about time management, you see that if you see the smart woodcutters, now a woodcutter doesn't go immediately and cut the, cut the, cut the trees. The smart woodcutters, they spend a long time sharpening their ax, as it is said, if I had eight hours to cut a tree, I would spend six hours sharpening my ax. That means planning, preparation, thinking about it, contemplating, organizing. These are the important things for the time management thing. I think you might have heard about Stephen Covey's time jar. I think some of you might have seen. Okay, there was an experiment conducted. Now we, uh, now we have it. So uh, look at the time jar. It speaks about if you organize. You no, know, there is a jar, and there are you have got stones, pebbles, and sand. If you put the stones first, and the pebbles next and the sand later on, you will never be able to fill the, sand, fill the stands, uh, sands. Now, sorry, the other way around. If you put the sand first, the pebbles and the stones later, uh, later on, you will never be able to fit in all the stones. Consider the stones as most important aspects of your life. Stones could be your education, your life, your marriage, your priorities, your health, your family, your spouse or your family, or your father and mother. Those are the priorities in your life. Or perhaps somebody would consider a job as a priority. If that is a priority in your life, the pebbles are least important, they are less important things. Things which you can delay, which you can postpone, which doesn't need immediate attention. Sands are like, uh, you know, things which are quite materialistic. Go for shopping to buy something, going for a tour, going for a, uh, the party, okay, going for a picnic that can be avoided. You can excuse yourself from your friend, apologize, if you have an important activity to attend to. So Stephen Covey's time jar theory, you know, just look for it, you will get it from the internet. Now, look at this picture. What does it speak about? I'm sure you can understand what we are speaking about. It's one of those very catchy... So um, multitasking? Exactly. Okay, thank you so much once again. Okay, it is exactly multitasking. Now, we all are very proud and you know, we are being judged whether you can multitask at the same time. Um, I've you know, conducted a small study on this and I found that from the desk research, it said that only 2.5% of the undergraduates can do two things at once without performance deficits. Now, that's what is important. You're not an exceptional multitasker. Even if you belong to the 2.5%, there are impediments in multitasking. That's why when you speak to somebody and drive, and when you reach a destination, you don't realize, oh, I'm, I've reached. Because when you speak to somebody, your mind will create mental images of the person you're speaking to. 
And that's where they say 300% is the chance of getting in an accident when you speak on the phone, whether you use a Bluetooth or whether you, you know, use your phone directly. The, the brain switches between the speaker and the driving. That's why we are almost blind when we drive. So our reactions will be very slow when we drive. There are lots of perils of multitasking said by some researchers. People uh, who multitask feel they are accomplishing, but they're actually cutting down their own productivity. So it lowers IQ. You know, there, it is found that an average desk job employee lo loses 2.1 hours a day due to interactions, sorry, interruptions and distractions. There are lots of things, you know, including missing a night of sleep. And uh, it is in, in one of the studies it said, it's twice the effect of smoking marijuana. So multitasking has its own. So it's not as with the, I know that we can't, we can't live without multitasking, but you must know the danger of multitasking because it can lead to disorganized mind. It impairs your ability to think and effectively switch between the tasks. So we are not able to focus carefully on one task because we need change. Perhaps you can see that nowadays the students, the small children these days, they can't focus on something um, patiently. They can't, their attention span is very slow okay, because they are used to games and when there is this complete change of the pictures and surroundings around them. So it's very difficult. I think you might have heard about the, uh, the online novelist Stephen King. Um, Stephen King stopped his um, novel, online novel, because um, he said in one of those interviews that few people are reading this, his novels these days. And he found that the online people um, you know, have the attention span of a grasshopper. So when you, if it is an online activity, unlike a book, when you have a book, you have more attention span. Online, it gives a lot of opportunities for distraction, the colors and the pictures. So it gives you that this, this telephone and the mobile phones are created in such a way that you can multitask. There's nothing harm in it, but make sure that when you focus on something, give complete 100% attention on that. It's very difficult. I myself, as uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, I have heavy use of social media. So when I focus on something, I literally keep my mobile phone away because of the buzz and the rings. It's very difficult to focus on. So you have to physically distance yourself uh, with the multitasking. Someone, uh, sometimes some of our students also do that. They keep their mobile phone on my desk before the lectures because they realize that if the phone is with them, they are going to be distracted. Now, psychologists call distraction as inattentional blindness. In, in, so we are not able to focus on something which is very carefully, and we are blinded in most of the cases. That leads to the next point of our discussion, the fifth point of the seven, stress. Now, I don't need to explain what stress is, whether you are in the office, whether you are at home, whether you're a student or a teacher, or a professional, we all suffer from the same syndrome of stress. But all, not all stress are bad. In fact, good stress and bad stress are there. I think some of you know about it. The eustress or good stress is a type of feeling we feel excited when you are going for, um, you know, um, say for example, playing a game, or you're going to a thrilling ride. You're extremely thrilled. You're playing a game, look at the, uh, the, the the PlayStation games, these is all the mobile phone games or the PUBG, which is recently banned by India. Look at the involvement. A person who plays PUBG or any video game is 100% involved in that, um, not even drinking a sip of water, but you enjoyed it. You are under stress, but you enjoy that stress. That happens when you play a game also, whether it's a, you know, playing badminton or football or shuttle or caroms or chess. When you are playing with somebody who is almost a comparable uh, level, you enjoy the game. Whereas you think that high, the other person is very high of your level, you don't. You stop enjoying the game because he always beats you. She beats you all the time. So that's exactly, and the same goes with the other way around also. You're playing with a small, I mean, a person who doesn't have enough uh, ability to play that game. Yeah, you can play it for courtesy sake, you can, like playing with a small child, you can play it for a courtesy sake, but you don't enjoy the game as such. So that is all. So you need good stress, to understand that every part of it, that's why you have presentation, that's why we have examinations. You have to under, undergo that because we need that kind of good stress. Bad stress is, on the other hand, is the inability to concentrate or complete the tasks. 
and it will affect you physically. Some people lose appetite. Some people sleep um, uh, sleep patterns are affected. Some people eat more. Some people eat less. Some people sleep more when they are stressed. Some people can't sleep. But there's a lot of physical irritability. There's a reaction on you. In fact, as we said earlier, good stress is an important thing. You know, it enhances function. When you know that you have a presentation, it gives you a stress. But it give, you think about the long term. Um, long-term aspect what is the what's the benefit out of this you are undergoing a study it is hard you have got to do your work but you still have something to achieve at the end of it that's called good stress distress on the other hand is bad because it can affect you mentally and physically there can be anxiety depression it can be chronic altogether so now good stress and bad stress now if you talk about human function curve okay you see that on the on the y axis is performance on the x axis it's arousal we need some kind of healthy tension in order to achieve something effectively so this is a healthy tension so you need this healthy tension when you when you need to achieve something this is the intended performance but when you are overtly working on it when you do not have support systems around you that can lead to a sudden burnout it can lead to fatigue on we and distress at this time. So that can lead to your uh, ill health in that way. Now, how bad stress can become good stress? You need to shift the perception, see the, the goodness, if there is there. If it is not there, then leave it. Focusing on the resources, you have to meet the challenge. Seeing the potential benefits, reminding yourself, what kind of strength will I get it out of this? Now, do I have the strength? Having a positive mindset is an important thing. Thinking like an optimist is an important thing. So if you want to manage stress, these are some of the tips, physical activities. If you involve in physical activities, it will take some of you, go to the gym. Now, nowadays, if you can't go to the gym, go for cycling, do some activities, do yoga. It's very uh, important. And then some relaxation techniques, talk to somebody. Now, make sure that you talk to somebody whom you can trust when you have problems, not to anyone. And write it down because, uh, again, emotional intelligence says that if you write down your emotional uh, stressful situation, uh, your amygdala, you know, the language cortex of the brain gets engaged and you can now create more um, more meaningful activity to come out of the stress because you've identified, because you're linguistically proving that this is what the action that causes me stress. So writing down. And sometimes you learn to accept the change, the mindset of adapting to change. Right attitude is an important thing. Now here, um, let, let me talk about Walter Mitchell's marshmallow experiment which is very famous when you talk about the attitude of the people now some of you definitely know about this experiment walter michel in, in 1960 65 period uh, he conducted this test among four-year-olds and five-year-old children he gave one marshmallow the sweet to the children and said um, if you wait for 20 minutes you will get the second marshmallow and some kids were waiting patiently, but some could, kids couldn't wait. They went for you know, self-gratification immediate. Uh, they find it very difficult to control their impulses. Now, those who have waited after 20 minutes, he has, has given the second marshmallow. So when you can see that you no know, grat instant gratification is a danger by itself. Patience, tolerance are something which has to be learned in these days. That's what is being taught there. 20 years later, Michelle has followed these children. 20, 15, 20 years later, they have got higher test scores. They finished their graduate school and the college. They became successful in life. So the experiment shows that, you no, know, the experiment, okay, I don't want to go into the uh, video because we might not lose that. You can check for marshmallow experiment on YouTube. After all, the children who waited for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, they concluded that um, they were those who ate the marshmallow were impulsive and they wanted instant gratification. And Michel said that they probably had behavioral issues at home and at school. It's very difficult for them to maintain a friendship and they struggled in stressful situations. The children who waited, they controlled their impl impulse. They said to have a more successful future than the impulsive kids. Okay, um, those who, uh, again, those who want to um, check for it, look for this. Uh, I don't know whether you have seen this. Jay Shetty is very popular, very famous. If you have been rejected, 
Okay, let me see. I can play this video to you. If there is no uh, sound, please give me a shout. Okay. Yeah, David, come on in. How's the family? They're doing well. I uh, I heard there's a promotion coming up next quarter. I'd love to throw my name in the hat. Yeah, uh, you know what? I've been looking at the numbers and. Yours don't seem to be quite up to what we need. Uh, I'm sorry. With all due respect, sir, I've, I've, I've been here five years. I mean, I've worked 60, 70 hours a week. I show up earlier than anyone here. I'm the hardest worker you have. This is not a question of work ethic, David. I love working with you. You bring a great energy and, and work ethic, but it, sometimes it just comes down to cold, hard facts. And we need numbers. I don't understand. What are you saying? We have to let you go. I don't understand. The truth is, you're just not the right fit. Okay. Thanks for your opportunity. Good to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. So what are you up to? Uh, I've actually, since I saw you, I started my own company. I'm doing what I love every day. It's going really well. I'm so happy to hear that. Thanks. You know, actually, I mean, thank you. Because you said what I did before wasn't the right fit, and you were right. So thank you. That's great to hear. Yeah. I've always liked you. Really great to see you. Thanks. Hey, let's grab a drink sometime. I love that, yeah. Let's do it. Great. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. We should actually be extremely grateful that some things don't work out the way we once wanted them to. When we get rejected or we fail or things don't go our way, we feel we're further away from our goal. But sometimes it's in those moments that we have the greatest opportunity to reflect, refuel and refocus. It's in those moments that feel like the death of our dreams that our truest potential is actually taking birth. If a door doesn't open, it's not your door. Often we're trying to climb ladders that are not ours to climb. Is your dream really your dream? Are you chasing what you truly want? I remember one of my mentors telling me that in our pain, we find our greatest power. Success is not built on success. It's built on failure. It's built on frustration. It's built on fears that you have to overcome. Sometimes it takes a good fall to really know where you stand. Every time we think we're being rejected from something good, remember, we're just being redirected to something better. Thank okay, you for so watching this four part video, which I wanted to share for the, you know, the most important thing is to face the difficulty um, in, in the way in which you have to um, understand it. You will come across situations where you have no control over the things that are happening around, but it depends on how you react to the situation. That's what is important. And if you can watch Jay Shetty, a lot of motivational videos for students, especially to speak to you about, you know, about the life and the different situations. Okay, so that, that's coming to us. Um, that takes us to the seventh the last point of the, the session here. Brands and what they're known for. I think, you know, you might have heard, seen these brands, and I'm sure all of you could predict all these brands. It's nothing, very popular brands. But you know that each brand has a value that is created. When you hear that brand, we have some kind of emotional value towards it. When you hear about Volvo, they are said to be the number one in safety. So you look for Volvo, that safety aspect comes there. When you think about Mercedes-Benz, the luxury aspect of it, 
When you think about iPhone, the reliability part of it, Red Bull, look at that. No, so it speaks about the adventure. When you talk about any action adventures, you know, bike riding, rallies, or that's the adventure aspect, the FedEx, okay, the, the, the courier service. It's a trust. We can be completely reliable about that service. Swiss watch, watches talks about precision. It will never change. It will, um, you know, it will never. So not a, not a milli uh, second of the time will be different. That's the Swiss watches. Now, we know that these brands and how they have created these values, they strive for it for over the years of time. Now, if I may ask you, if you were a brand, what would you be known for? What kind of a value that we are known among the people around us, people who are maybe in the classrooms, maybe in our staff rooms, maybe in the offices that we have? You understand that everybody, we have an impression about them. They don't realize it, but we do have an impression about it. We think, that oh, he's very strong, he's very hardworking, he's very funny, he's romantic, he's... Let it, let it be whatever it is. Now, we have an impression about them. Knowingly or unknowingly, we are creating our own brand values around us. If you can create positive brand value, now think about this brand value. If you can describe yourself in any of those three words, ability, behavior, maturity, personality, and attitude. Now look at what kind of personality. Are we, um, say, excellent in ability or very good? Or are we average? Uh, behavior, you know, are we well behaved or thoughtless and disruptive? Uh, are we an embar embarrassment in the public? Maturity, is it sensible, self motivated, or very childish, uh, sincere, I mean, selfish and shy? How, what is our personality? Are we well developed all round, or are we just one sided? We like the curiosity. And attitude wise, are we enthusiastic to learn things, or are we very passive, feels, you know, unmotivated? Consciously look upon, especially you know, uh, youngsters who are looking for the jobs. What is a brand value? If you were a, if you were a product, what is that value that you uh, spread across? Okay, try to put more positive values. Try to look at that. If you take a, a tip from the management lesson, if you look at uh, the product you, the brand you, our career life cycle is very similar to life cycle of a product. Okay, just like a product which has an introduction, the growth, maturity, and decline. We all have an introduction, the new startup, you know, one or two, three years, the growth, there's a maturity, you reach the peak of your uh, career, and then there's a decline. We have to understand that there is a decline. So make sure you create a brand name, a brand image by yourself, which is uh, which you wanted to become. So what do you want to become in the future? We might choose different professions in future, but it all depends on what you want to become. Decide, am I, work, am I working closer to my goal? Am I really working towards achieving my passion and the ambition that I dream about? You must know what your employers are looking for. What do you think, uh, you know, the employers look when recruiting students or the graduates? Um, you know, to some of this, companies are continuing to rate their employees into personal skills, more important than their analytical abilities. It's often said that hard skills will get you to an interview, but you need soft skills to get and keep the job or keep it going. Because interviews are mostly based on, you know, your IQ, your certificate, your percentage is calculated. Success is based not only on what you know, but also you know how to communicate your knowledge. That's very important. So employers are looking for those with high employability skills and lots more to build up the employability skills while at the university is very important. Students should know that when you create a CV, you know, every six months you have something positive, at least, you know, or every couple of months, I would say, to look for something positive that you have done, you have done creatively to improve your abilities and to prove yourself. It could be inside or outside university. It could be um, charity work that you're involved in, fine. It could be a bleak beach cleaning drive, that's fine. Uh, or it could be college activities, or you could work you know, with your influence. You could work in a company which you know your uncle is working there, your father works there, your mother works there, your aunt works there. Somewhere you get to see that you, know, you have to work somewhere to prove your employer that I have something more than the rest of the guys. I stand different. So I stand very different from the rest of the people. So this is what we look forward to. Uh, in this session um, that what we have just seen 
is we have just spoken about the general employability skills. We spoke about communication, emotional intelligence, time management, stress, right attitude. And finally, we spoke about the brand you. What is the image that we keep around? Thank you for the session. And I like the interaction in between also. I wish students could interact, but I know that it's a YouTube uh, broadcast. Um, okay, it's a webcast. So uh, I wish you all the best. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Thank you. Very true, sir. Such a wonderful and inspiring session you have delivered. It was uh, immensely, you know, inspirational. So we have uh, certainly yes. have you uh, some questions for you. Um, Seema Srivastava. Uh,